it's time for my 11th book review of 2021. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. On this channel, we post writing tips, book reviews, unboxings, and the occasional vlog. And today we have my 11th book review for you. And this was a, another book club book review, which is a book club I'm in with Jazz over at Red Panda Reads. And the book this time was Lovely War by Julie Berry. Lovely War is a historical romance, but with some fantasy elements which you'll understand in just a bit. But first, let me read you guys the blurb. In the perilous days of World Wars 1 and 2, the gods held the fates and the hearts of four mortals in their hands. Hazel, James, Aubrey and Colette. A classical pianist from London, a British would-be architect turned soldier, a Harlem-born ragtime genius in the US Army and a Belgian orphan with a gorgeous voice and a devastating past. Their story, as told by goddess Aphrodite, who must spin the tale of face judgement on Mount Olympus, is filled with hope and heartbreak, prejudice and passion and reveals that the war is a formidable force it's no match for the transcendent power of love. And then there is a review on the back from the New York Times book review, which is, does love conquer war? The answer is never in doubt, but it's a pleasure to have it confirmed by a celestially inspired storyteller. So this book is a romance which follows Hazel and James and also Aubrey and Colette, but it's told from the point of view of the Greek goddess Aphrodite telling a story to Ares, Apollo, Hades and I butcher his name, Hephaestus, 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 the good god of forges and smithery, you know the guy. This one, like a lot of our book club books, caused a little bit of a rift in the group, but overall, it was pretty good. As always, I will do spoiler free at the start, then I will warn you when spoilers are about to take place. Julie Berry is definitely an amazing writer. She is very, very good. Everything is shown rather than told, even though it is the gods telling a story, they still show all the emotions and the feelings. She is very good at writing um, PTSD, which affects some of the characters in this book. And also, if you go to the back, is a keen historian. The main characters are completely fiction but the captains and some background characters are based on real life people and are placed in places they were actually in their lives. And these things actually happen to some of these people, which is horrible, but something we can't escape. As with a lot of our um, book club books as well, it seems to tackle a lot of racism and sexism in this book. It's set in World War One, which, I mean, England is sexist and racist now, but it was a lot worse back then. The good thing is that the characters that we follow are not racist or sexist and they don't follow those norms and they're very modern people fighting in this era and something which I did really appreciate in this book if you've seen my review on the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society the links above if you haven't in that book that author mentions a specific doll which across the board our book club generally believed wasn't needed and was just kind of upsetting to read whereas in this book on page 349 it mentions one of the worst words used but instead of writing the word and making us read it, it stars out half the letters. And that's the only time it's used in this book and it is starred out. So it doesn't deny that that word would have been used, but it doesn't put us through having to read it or see it. And because the characters are very modern as well, they talk about something happening and then they say, of course, that was not the words that were used at the time to obviously avoid having to say these really bad words. And I really appreciated that. It was much more refreshing to read than when it did it in the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pasta Society. Even though that was a really good book, that one bit really upset me. So I'm really happy that Julie Berry found a way around that. It also goes into the sexism as well, in the relationships, it's traditionally in those days, especially the man approaching the woman and da 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 da, which does happen in this, but the women also take things into their own control, the women are working, they are volunteering, and they're generally quite strong individuals 
as themselves also and I find that really good. In this book one of my favourite metaphors was she'd sailed upon the quiet ripple of her parents lives. The reason I love that metaphor is because the plot of the story, Hazel has just been on a boat and then the following metaphor uses that she's been on a boat to describe how she's done as her parents have said and just sort of followed them in life and that was just really good writing. This book is written very very well. There was something though which a few of us noted. This book begins in London. It kind of sounds more like New York and then on page 94, now I will point out in our book club there were six of us who read this book and only two of us noticed this but once we said it everyone agreed. I don't know why it happened but on page 94 it says 30 degrees below zero. This is in France. This annoyed us so much because we looked it up and we were like all right maybe they've just done it in the American Fahrenheit instead by an accident. No, no, no. It's just for some reason they thought that France would get to minus 30 degrees. And then on the next page it says he pulled his hands from his pockets and blew on them. His breath turned to ice before it could do any good. No. A, they're on a train full of people. I know it's a baggage car but they're on a train. Then our book club said how is that not picked up by an editor but this is an American book. Maybe the American editors weren't looking for degrees. French weather. I know this is sad but we even looked at the weather reports for the date that it was done and it was rainy and overcast. It was not minus 30. No. I am going to go into spoiler alert now just in case with the page numbers and any more quotes I give too much away. So spoiler alert guys, spoiler alert. If you haven't read the book yet and you don't want any spoilers please go to this time here. If you have read the book and you want to hear more opinions on it or if you haven't read it but you're happy to have some spoilers then stay tuned and we'll continue on. All right, spoiler time. I don't know how many people will agree with me. Me and Matt are the only people in our book club who have read Terry Pratchett, which is a sin. Hades comes into play. There's two things with Hades. One, he reminds me of Terry Pratchett's death because he's very fatherly, he doesn't seem to hate humans, he's very nice. He's also quite sarcastic and funny. At one point when someone dies, he's like, oh, look out for the cats. I have made this for you. Oh, thank you. What is it? Albert said there ought to be snow on it, but it appears to have melted. It is, of course, a Hogswatch card. Oh. There should have been a robin on it as well, but I had considerable difficulty in getting it to stay on. The second point about Hades I think I read too much into Hades being the chapter header but it did add a little bit of tension to the story because Hades first appears on Aubrey's chapters. Now Aubrey is a black jazz American musician in the American army who's been sent over to France. He is liaison him with two women not on his side of the camp. So when Hades appeared on his chapter I was like Aubrey's gonna get it that's it. Aubrey's dead. I love Aubrey. I don't want him to die but that's Aubrey. He's gone. It wasn't Aubrey. And I like that because then whenever Hades appeared you start to be like oh who is it? Who's gonna die? And it was always side characters albeit important ones but it was always side characters. And you'll keep reading, you'll keep reading and then you know you're like it's gotta get one of the four mains. It's a war romance. Someone's gotta die. And you're presuming that it's either gonna be James or Aubrey and I was, I was still pinning on it being Aubrey Blossom because it's always the underdog who's got the worst life going. The twist she got me it was Hazel in the train accident and I loved that. That was really good. But then Aphrodite goes to Hades and pleads for Hazel's life. Now I don't want to give away the spoiler for this one but I'm happy with the result and also not happy at the same time but I think no matter which way it went that would be my emotion so I don't think there's a way to win but I did really enjoy the end and I did really enjoy what happened to Hazel as well. I'm not going to tell you which one it was but hey you can find out. But that did add a little bit of tension to it. The overall idea of having the Greek gods mixed in with a traditional romance. Now I thought it did add a little more excitement to it because I generally wouldn't just pick up a wartime romance, they're pretty generic, you know how it's gonna go. 
but because this one had the Greek gods and you're like, oh, a bit different, that could be interesting. I did discuss in the book club perhaps that was actually almost a marketing ploy in some ways by Julie Berry because this book goes into a lot of war history, it tells you a lot of hidden history which you aren't necessarily taught in school, it also tackles racism and sexism and generally the pointlessness of war and what it does to everyone involved and I almost feel like to get that point across she wanted the biggest audience possible. Now romance is the biggest selling genre out there. If you write a romance book you're gonna get a big audience but you're not gonna get everyone. There's a lot of people who avoid romance entirely. Enter the Greek gods and you've got some fantasy fiction mythological people coming in there too. So again, you're broadening the audience range to get your point across. In the book club, we thought the points were very pungent and very important in this book, but we didn't know if they were necessarily to the forefront enough for that to be what she was doing. It might just be that she had this interesting idea. And it was half thought that maybe the book would have been just as good without them or that they weren't utilized enough. I thought it was still good. They were still interesting. It did just add another layer to it, but maybe could have been used a bit more. A few quotes that I want to discuss in this. One is page 75, as masterfully as any man might. It's an interesting description choice. She uses this to describe a woman playing the piano and saying it's as masterful as any man might play it. I don't like how it's comparing a woman pianist to a male pianist. They're just pianists. It shouldn't matter the gender. It's a piano. You play it as well as you play it. But I don't know if that was to signify the time period in the book or what, but I didn't like that one so much. But then on page 78, I have a quote that I absolutely adored, which was, if he was trying to kill her through kiss deprivation, it was working. I adored that. It was so cute. I mean, this is about Hazel and James, a young couple. They're both so innocent. And yeah, he just, he didn't want to kiss her until just before he left, but then he didn't get, it was just fun. I, I did enjoy that. It's very teasy. And there are a lot of descriptions like this, which I quite like. On page 98, Hazel had never even comforted a dog. Perhaps she'd made a grave mistake. I thought this was a really interesting description choice as well. Hazel at this point is heading to France to volunteer at the YMCA on the camps there. The fact that she says that she's never comforted a dog before. Now, the tradition in writing is if you want to make someone a villain, quick and easy way, make them kick a dog. Instant villain, everyone will hate that character from that point onwards. No matter what else they do, they'll kick the dog, that's it. So the fact that Julie Berry uses that kind of dog description and saying that she's never even comforted a dog and she's going to go and comfort these people who are on the front lines who have been sent to war, I find it an interesting choice. And also it shows just how innocent and also how unworldly Hazel is. She's never even had a pet or looked after an animal. Now she's going to go off to France. Tough choice to do, man. Then on page 102, Mrs. Davies appears. Mrs. Davies is the scum of the earth in this book. She is horrible. I loved on page 102 how Hazel has just met this woman, her first job out in the world all by herself, and she instantly challenges this Mrs. Davies to be like, well, why can't I perform in the colored tents? Why can't they come to this tent? Why I'm, I'm here to entertain, I entertain everyone. I don't just entertain white people. Mwah. Love it. It was, yes, Hazel, yes. And it links back to when she was a child and she sat with her father turning pages whilst he played piano. And I didn't know this, performers used to paint their faces black to mimic and joke about black musicians. What? And her father says that he hopes that she is braver than him and stands up against this because he's not brave enough to stand up and stop it even though he disagrees with it. And I love how Hazel, first thing she does is stick to that promise and she tries to fight for them. On page 158, you know how I like like good friendships in books and just the friendship between Joey Rice and Aubrey is just so beautiful. It's when they're in the toilet queue and they're joking about diarrhea because he covered for him when he was off seeing Colette and I just love their friendship. Sadly it does also tell you someone's going to die. The foreshadowing in this book, I really like, and also she did trick me with the foreshadowing, but this is a sort of insignificant one, but for me, it links to the front of the book. You want, I always wondered, when is the pink coat coming in? You know, pink is obviously an important color in this book. First thing is that Colette puts a pink flower into Hazel's coat before they meet James in Paris. 
But then page 273 is when James buys her this pink coat. And then for me, this pink coat almost becomes like the red coat in Schindler's List. It makes her stand out. She is the beauty and the colour in this otherwise grey and dark and brown wartime world. But she is the hope. And that also foreshadows how she is the help which helps James through his PTSD. Even though he tries to push her away at first, she isn't the cure, but she sure does help it out to get through it. Page 302, the cheese. I think I've just written all of my notes from page 302 to 312. The amount of cheese, and by cheese, I mean like Indiana Jones and his hat version of cheese. We've got the battle beginning, and obviously to the guys from are going, you owe me money, I knew it would be this day, but you can have your money after. No, I don't take money off the dead guy. Love it. There's always got to be a cheesy money gift in there, don't I? It's a war. They've obviously bet on things. And then when James and Mason get hoisted over the top and Mason falls on top of James, he's like, oh, sorry, chap, as he's rolled across his arse. Again, it's so cheesy and so cliche. I really like that. Matt doesn't tend to like it that much. He finds it really cheesy, but I love cheese. I've never denied my love of cheese. I love Disney and I love of Disney music. I'm all for the cheese. And that's it for the quotes from this book. So an overall view again. The love of first side trope which is used between Hazel and James. I quite enjoyed but it's only because it was balanced out by Colour and Aubrey's far more mature and modern love. Uh, my theory was that you know again if we're going off this idea that Julie Berry wants this book to be seen by as a wider range of audience as possible if my grandma read this book, she would love Hazel and James because it's a traditional love story, it's old-fashioned, it follows the rules. Whereas I fell in love with Aubrey and Colette because it felt real, it was love through pain, it wasn't just instant, they thought about it, they rationalised it. And that's what I gravitated towards, that's because that's, you know, in the times of the war, you got married very quickly you got chaperoned you weren't generally alone that often before you got married compare that to now where you know i'm not married but me and matt have been together for 11 years and we live together and um, so basically compared to that era we lived the life of a married couple and yet we're not married it would be just beyond belief in those days to do such a thing so it is a lot faster to get married and perhaps that also means you you feel those new emotions of a new relationship a lot earlier. You know, like now we sort of get that out of our system when we're teenagers, but then maybe, you know, you had it and then you married them and then you thought about it afterwards, which is then a bit too late. Would I recommend it? Yes. Like the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, it's a very easy read. It takes you away from the modern world. It's brutal, far, far brutal, but it's overshadowed by the pure love and the reasoning of Aphrodite of why love conquers all and why war is bad. So I would recommend reading this. She is a very good writer, definitely done her history, done her homework. Writing style is very, very good. For the stars, comparing it to the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, a 10 out of 10. I wouldn't read it again, but I I'm gonna pass it on. So I definitely would recommend people to read it. I want other people to read it. It is a very beautifully written, well-rounded and thought out book. And that's it for my 11th book review of 2021. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe to my channel. If you'd like to see as soon as I upload, click that little bell down below. You can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or Tumblr. I post general bookish pictures, as well as my writing tips and unboxings on there. And thanks for watching, guys. Bye.